stage is yours. Thank you very much. Well, let me start by saying uh, what a pleasure and indeed an honor it is to be here with you this afternoon in Riga, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, my name is Martin Borrett. I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer, and I'm lucky enough to be the, the CTO for IBM Security Business Unit here in Europe. And this afternoon, I'm going to spend a little bit of time expanding on what Peter talked about this morning, talking about uh, cognitive security. But, but let me start here by reflecting on the fact that, you know, IBM itself has a, a long history of grand computing challenges. I don't have to think so far back, back into the 90s, when the grand challenge of the day was beating the then chess world champion, Gary Kasparov, at chess. And we meant, spent many years, invested a lot of research effort in building a supercomputer, which eventually, in 1997, did beat Gary at chess. So we had a bespoke supercomputer. It would have filled much of this room, incredible computing power to eventually beat someone at a very structured game. Now, in recent years, the challenge we took on, which Peter also spoke to, was to play a very different sort of game the game of Jeopardy. Is anyone familiar with Jeopardy? A few of you? Almost all of you. So Jeopardy is very different from chess, I think you would agree. It's a word game for a start. It's based on natural language, English. And it's full of the subtleties of the English language, full of double entendres and other things that intuitively you would think a computer would be absolutely hopeless at. And yet also, after just a few years in 2011, we were able to beat the two best people at Jeopardy with uh, one of the world's first cognitive systems, Watson. Now, it's really interesting that that system had over 200 million pages of structured and unstructured information in its, in its corpus. You know, taking up some four terabytes of, of storage and the whole text of Wikipedia. You know, and what's, what's interesting is that these cognitive systems can really understand natural language. And they're fundamentally different. You know, they're not so much programmed as taught. And that, that's a key difference. And so over the last few years, since 2011, we've been taking that grand challenge, that research project, and turning it into a set of industry-aligned solutions, notably Watson Healthcare and, and others. And so over the last 18 months or so, 18 months, two years, we've really been working on, this is, this is a fantastic approach. What could it do for us in security? And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. But let me, let me break the ice with a short story. I love, love to tell a short story when I'm talking to audiences. And my favorite story is about this castle. And I'm curious if anyone recognizes it at all in the audience. Anyone recognize it? I'll put you. No, I'll put you out of your misery. So this this is the Scala Castle, the Scala Castle in the town of Siromone, on the southern shores of Lake Garda, in the very north of Italy. And this particular castle was built in 1151 by a wealthy landowner, his family, who ruled over that surrounding region of Italy. And at the time the castle was built, it was absolutely state of the art, the very latest castle technology. It has these grand, robust turrets and walls and ramparts that you can see here in the picture. The stone walls of the castle are over a meter thick in places. It stands on a small island in, in the lake, joined by a drawbridge that would be raised and lowered, portcullis, fantastic. Everything they could build at the time, undefeatable. And so it was for 100 years. 100 years passed by deep into the 13th century, 1251 to be exact, when the castle was eventually ransacked because a disruptive warfare technology crept into Europe in the 13th century. Gunpowder. And with gunpowder came guns and cannons and what seemed at the time as a fantastic design to build these big square-faced turrets and walls was really a mistake with hindsight. You could hardly miss with a cannonball. The cannonball simply smashed through the walls, and you may see in places the render has been restored here in this picture. 
Now, what's interesting is that after this time, castle design and thinking around castle design changed. It evolved. People started to build castles with round turrets, simple round turrets and rounded ramparts to help deflect objects like cannonballs. And the reason that I like to tell that story, whether I'm talking to security professionals like yourselves or just the general public, is it does remind us that we're never done with security. It is a continuum. And there are always new threats and new challenges around the corner that we can't necessarily predict today. And so the approach that we choose to take, our strategy, the policies, the architecture we put in place, it needs to be adaptable. It needs to be agile. It needs to be able to respond and adapt and change as the threats evolve. And so if I think about security today, of course, it's nothing like the castles of old. It's not around about perimeter controls anymore. That isn't to say you can throw away your antivirus and your firewalls and these other perimeter type solutions and technologies. They're still necessary. It's just they're not sufficient. Necessary, but not sufficient. For the last 10 years or so, I think many of us in this room have been focusing in on security intelligence solutions, security analytics, ways to give our organizations visibility of the cybersecurity threats they face, visibility over what insiders inside the organizations are doing. And we've made great progress here, consuming vast amounts of structured data from logs and across the networks, and building tools with more and more powerful and sophisticated analytics. And whilst that's good progress, we still haven't solved the problem. And this is where we think cognitive can really have a role to play. So if I think about the problems we face, three things come to my mind. I think the piece that's most telling is, is the skills gap. I think many organizations are still struggling to find the skilled security professionals that they need to help their organizations. They're struggling to find the security analysts that they need to staff the security operation centers they have and that many organizations are building. Skills is a real challenge. Finding skilled and experienced people who can really understand the threat, analyze them, help those organizations. And despite the progress around security intelligence and security analytics, it is still very, very difficult to get timely and actionable information from these systems in context. It's hard to spot whether something is a false positive or a real incident. And if it is a real incident, what is its impact to my organization? That's incredibly difficult. And so if I think about what we do today, as I've said, with security intelligence, we do a good job with traditional security data, gathering logs and files from our network, from our security tools, network traffic flows, data, all millions and millions of events per second of structured information that are being analyzed by, the, by these tools. And that's, that's good. That's good progress. But it's not enough. And we're missing a whole piece of the picture. There's a whole piece of the puzzle here that's really dark or hidden to us. And it's this. It's all of the human-generated knowledge and information that we have available to us today. It's things like research papers, cert advisories, expert commentary, blogs, analyst papers. There's all sorts of human-generated, natural language, written information that we struggle. We simply struggle to take advantage of. Right? You, can, you can barely scratch the surface of this. And, and why is that? Because there's actually huge volumes of this information available to us if we were investigating a cyber incident. And more is being generated on a daily basis. 
To give you an idea, there's something like 2,000 security blogs written every day worldwide, 500 news articles, 30 vulnerability reports, 30 research papers. If I add all of that up, that's millions and millions of words, 7,400 pages, pages, I need some pages, of written information every day. Now, I can only read about 150 words a minute read and comprehend and really understand 150 words a minute. So there's a massive consumability problem here. This could be, all of this could be valuable information, the known knowns that I could use to understand, investigate and deal with a cybersecurity incident against my organization. But I just struggle to tap into it. And so this is where the, the real promise of cognitive security comes in. What if I could use cognitive and Watson to build a system that could consume all of that human-generated knowledge, could consume it, understand it, reason through it, offer me expert advice, and learn through machine learning as we go, a system that could answer my questions, that could use machine learning, that wasn't biased consciously or unconsciously. A system that doesn't get bored or tired or ignore something because it's not so interesting and give me really objective advice. Now in this scenario, we still see that the security analyst is, is really important here. The human security analyst with his common sense, his intuition, his moral judgment, and he's still going to be working with the security analytic tools. We don't see that going away either with cognitive. Those security analytics, those powerful algorithms are going to look through millions of data points within your organizational boundaries, within your organization. They're going to do the advanced analytics, the pattern analysis, the anomaly detection in real time on massive amounts of data. That will, that will continue. It's just that as we try to understand the false positives and the real events and investigate those incidents, it would be incredibly powerful to have a cognitive assistant that can look at all of this wealth of information and data outside of your organizational boundaries. And so this is really the promise of cognitive security. So one of the use cases that we're focusing in on right now, if I start to narrow the focus a little bit, we're really thinking about this chap, Raphael. Raphael is a junior security analyst. He's two years out of university, very, very bright guy, but he's not vastly experienced. He hasn't been doing information security for 10 or 15 or 20 years like some of us, right? But he's very capable and he tries to keep up with all of this research. He tries to stay current, he tries to read stuff in the morning on the way to work, at lunchtime, in the evenings. He does try to stay current. He reads the internal threat research, you know, previous research from incidents within that organization. He monitors the, the tools and the cues, the security intelligence products, the SEAM tools, reports incidents, investigates them, tries to tune things. But he is challenged on a, on a daily basis, and I've spoken to many Raphaels. Right? They're challenged on a daily basis about making the right decisions. It, is this normal behavior or not? Is this incident real? Should I investigate it? How far should I go? How much time should I spend? And you can spend at literally hours investigating an incident only to find it's a, it's a false positive. Hours and hours of time. And of course, we're, we're challenged by skills. So Raphael may not have an experienced colleague just sat next to him that he can turn to. And so, as I think about that use case, and I think about cognitive, what we're doing right now at IBM is building a cognitive security system called IBM Watson for cybersecurity. And so I need to tell you a little bit about how we're doing that and what's involved to give you a sense of how these systems work. 
So a couple of key phases. There is um, an ingestion and a learning phase. At the heart of these cognitive systems, there is a corpus of knowledge. So in the healthcare system, it's all the medical knowledge known to mankind. In, in the Jeopardy game, it's, it was all a Wikipedia and a lot of other information that's relevant. Here, we need to teach it all about security. We need to ingest credible and relevant documents, and right now we're selecting these documents from the public domain, so published research papers by universities, by government authorities, reputable sources. We're ingesting all of this human-generated knowledge into the corpus at, huge, at large volumes. This process starts manually, and there's, a, there's an annotation language involved. In fact, I'll come on to teaching and learning. There's, there's an annotation language involved to mark up these documents. It starts manually, and then as we make progress, we can start to automate that pro process. And we're targeting, you know, reaching levels around 10 to 15,000 documents a month that we're going to put into the system to build up that, that corpus of knowledge. And the other important piece here is that we have to teach um, what's in the language of security. Security is very different from healthcare. Uh, there's a whole different set of terminology and language and vocabulary that's used in taxonomy. We have to teach Watson that a honey pot is not something that Pooh Bear eats honey out of in the morning. And a back door is not the back door of this conference room. That a bug is not something flying through the air. That Lockie is not a town in Scotland or person's name. Actually, it's a type of malware. We have to teach it all of these things. And so that's what we're doing right now. And in May this year, we announced in New York that we were going to accelerate that teaching and learning process by recruiting eight North American universities, including MIT, to really help accelerate our efforts as we, as we build and teach this system. And that's really important. We're teaching it. It's not so much about programming as teaching. And how do we know when Watson, you know, like a small child, is, is getting the answers right? How do we know when he's ready to help customers? Well, through testing. So we ask Watson testing and control questions. We ask Watson questions for which we know the answer. And we watch as Watson extracts and searches its corpus of knowledge, looking for relevant evidence, extracts that, forms a hypothesis as to what it could be, and asserts that uh, back to the user. And we look at how he does. Did he get it right? Great. Did he get it wrong? Why did he get it wrong? How, what decision path did he follow? What uh, evidence did he extract? How did he come to that answer? And through this process, this iterating process, Watson learns. This is exactly what we've done with the healthcare and the other industry vertical systems that we built. It learns as it goes. And so we hope, as we develop this system, that it will act as an advisor to Raphael and will help in the whole process of investigating an offense or an incident. It's going to reduce the triage time from hours to maybe minutes. It's going to shorten down the whole process, the whole time taken to investigate incidents. But not only that, it's going to help Raphael be more effective in what he does. It's not just about shortening the time. It's also about better identification of threats, more efficiency in what he does, recognizing and dismissing false positives, understanding the impact and the ripple effects of, of incidents. And I think Raphael be, will be able to learn. You know, it'll also help in the, the teaching, the education process. He's going to learn from what, what Watson finds and the way he finds it. That can be used also as a learning tool to help Raphael uh, get more experience. So it's going to remove a lot of the heavy lifting uh, away from him. So I think Peter mentioned... Oh, shouldn't have done that. Peter mentioned... Um, that this is not generally available, that's true. Uh, so we're currently in a, a closed beta phase right now. So we're working 
with a number of clients in a beta program using this technology. And again, uh, the way we've accelerated that work uh, and the place we're going to start is by plugging into IBM's security intelligence platform, QRadar. So there is an application, an app, that plugs into QRadar locally. This is something the analyst can use as he's investigating an incident. He can select key indicators to send to Watson. So he can select them, and there's a level of investigation that can happen locally and visualization using the app, which has some cognitive capability itself, before the query is sent over the right side to Watson for cybersecurity, which is a cloud-based service. All right, so Watson's in the cloud with its huge corpus crunching the data. So we send our query, we select what we want to send, we send it to Watson, and Watson sends back a hypothesis based on its vast corpus of knowledge, based on its understanding, its reasoning, and what it's learned, and presents that back through the app to the user. And that information can interact locally. It may be that as a result of the hypothesis, the local system looks at some other incidents that may at first glance look unrelated, and in fact decides that there are actually three or four things that hadn't been spotted that relate to this, this same incident. And so, that's what we're working on right now in the beta with a number of clients with the anticipation of making this available early next year. Now, this is just one use case and one implementation. I think that's important to understand. You know, we feel that we need to start and anchor the journey somewhere on some real tangible value and prove, just like with the healthcare systems, that this can really work and add value and be part uh, of the capability you, you need to solve cyber incidents. But there are many other use cases for Watson. There are all sorts of things you could use a cognitive security capability like this. If you think about some of the characteristics, you know, Watson is very good at ingesting and digesting natural language, human generated information. So maybe think about Regulatory environments, that's one that always comes to my mind. You know, regulation is very verbose. Lots of written information, thick documents. That is the sort of stuff that Watson is very good at ingesting, understanding, reasoning through, and offering hypotheses. So maybe we could teach Watson about some of these new regulations. And it could give you expert advice about which clauses apply what applies, what doesn't apply. You can really use it as a visor. You could use it to improve application security. You could apply it to enterprise risk. There's a whole set of use cases as we start to think about the potential. And we're really just scratching the surface right now. We're at the start of a journey that I'm sure will go on for a number of years. But I hope you'll agree with me that, that the promise of this really starts to untap something new that we haven't had access to, a way of consuming all of that knowledge available to us as security professionals. You know, imagine it reading all the books on security, the books by Bruce Schneier and other luminaries, all the podcasts, all the videos, all the diagrams, all of that unstructured information that is, is hard to consume that we're, we're blind to. That, that is the power and potential. And so I'll I'll stop there, I'm roughly on time, or maybe a little early, but it gives us time for one or two questions, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. I can come up. Yeah, right. One second, one second, coming. Um, I've got a question, is it going to be open source and uh, the data, is that for everybody or do we have to pay for it? Oh, that's a great question, that's a great question. So right now we're building, we're starting the journey with a single corpus of knowledge that could be applied to any industry. There's no 
customization. And it will be a, a cloud-based service which we'll charge clients for. So there'll be some sort of subscription model of some sort to access and use the service. Uh, we haven't defined that yet because it's not, it's not generally available. We're just, we're just building it out. Um, but we'll, we'll open it out as a service. And in time, I think we'll open it out to other platforms. So we're going to start with QRadar, but that's really just a point in time statement. So in time, we'll open up the API, open it up so it can be accessed as a service, uh, much as some of the other Watson technologies are. But we do intend to charge for this capability. Okay, another question, please. Right. Uh, you know what, Martin, I will have one. Now, these systems, now, one thing is that you, you know, play, play you analyze your data with, with, with Watson and it's uh, human assistant decision making, so on. it just provides you not the data, but the information and you can, you know, open your mind and start thinking. Another thing is that uh, there are some, you know, solutions. Uh, you you trust your 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 security, your enterprise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, one thing is that I, what I know is that machine can be as smart as it, you know, as we humans teach it to be. Now. Uh, if, if we could better understand, maybe on some operational level, if you know, how exactly is this machine uh, learning? I understand it can, you know, consume a huge amount of data. It can make histogramic representations of the textual content. It can make, you know, color, color analysis of some images, etc., etc. It, it, has, et it has graph theory. Yeah, it has machine but, but, learning, but we, it has statistical we, we, algorithms, it has a whole set of techni technologies within it that couple together to provide, you know, cognitive capability, real artificial intelligence and machine learning in a humanistic way. Yeah, but uh, what was your question? Sorry. I, so I, the question I, is... Um, uh, now, is, is that a, a, some, some set of algorithms or, or, or some set of some triggers you, you, you teach to watch them in this case? Now, how, 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 how would it know that uh, this is bad and this is good just based on it just read something on the internet? And we know people write a lot of crap in the blogs as well. The one thing is technical paper and research yeah. paper, and another thing is, you know, John just said on his blog that, you know, I don't like this. And maybe it has bigger impact on, 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 on Watson than, than some scientific paper, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's an open question, but uh, all these things, so I would really, you know, give it a try, but as you said, to test it, to understand that if I already know the answer, I want to see if the machine finds it. Yeah. Okay, it the is in, 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 in a couple of seconds. Okay, now I start trusting a little bit. As a, but anyway, it's, it's, there's a huge way or transition to the moment, up to the moment when I can start trusting it yeah. with, with, with my security. Yeah, I think you're right. I think trust and confidence is a huge part of this. When I describe this to you now, it's probably a bit of a, a leap of faith, right? Will this really work? Does it work? So trust is a big part of it. When, we, uh, when I do demonstrate this sometimes, I have a demonstration I use sometimes with clients. Um, I think as an analyst, the first few times you're going to use this, you're going to want to understand exactly what Watson has done and why. And, and you can actually do that. You can trace the whole decision tree back to understand what evidence was extracted, what the linkages are, to get a sense of how it's, it's reasoned through this. And what I would say is that Watson uses a number of techniques and technologies that we've uh, developed over that time, you know, playing Jeopardy and building that system. Um, it does use graph theory, it has machine learning, it has artificial intelligence, it uses security analytics, it has statistical engines, it has a number of these capabilities. And we have research scientists who are working in the beta right now, tuning 
the system, trying to get the balance right between these different capabilities, making sure that it is learning and improving, because it's a self it is a self-teaching system. It will teach itself. It's not just about asking the control questions. If you want to know more about that, increasingly we're publishing you know, a number of two or three minute video clips. There's one very nice one from three leading IBM researchers on, on YouTube, you know, where they talk about just the sort of techniques and how they've been thinking about the problem and how they're applying it to this. Um, you know, we're on a journey. It took us a number of years to beat the people at Jeopardy. Yeah, um, if, I, if I go to Watson's site, I, I can find this, uh, you know, a button. Yeah, you can just security. find it on YouTube if you just look okay. up Cognitive or um, IBM, IBM Watson, IBM Watson for Cyber. There's, there's a whole set of video clips and demos, and there's a very nice one uh, of a colleague of mine, Jeb Linton, and um, talking about just how they teach it and, and actually showing how they mark up the documents, the taxonomy, the language. So we use... We used Cybox as the baseline when we started the project, which we built off. Cybox is used with Sticks and Taxi. So, you know, you can find uh, a lot more information than I can share in the short time. Okay, okay, Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, here's uh, 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 yeah, a nice applause. Well, thank yeah. you. That is very and, and, and there's a, a little gift and a certificate to, to hang on your wall. And, 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 and. For, for a great time, you, hopefully you have in Riga. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Martin. Thank you very much. Right. Uh,